The book came out of um, a talk I actually gave, or at least it seeded in my mind, um, because of a talk that I actually gave at the Federal Reserve. Um, so it's the summer of 2015. I've written, um, as some of you may know, I've read some of my other works, some disparaging things about the financial system and the Fed and private banking and Wall Street and so forth. And I got an email from the regulatory department at the Federal Reserve. Um, now, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be the regulator of all of the banks, but yes, they also have a department that does this specifically. Um, and they say, do you want to come and talk? We're, um, they have these annual... Uh, conferences for three days that are just the internal people from the Federal Reserve, uh, the IMF, and the World Bank. So they're not sort of public media things. They're not really handshaky photo op things. They're, they're sort of internal. They take place at the Fed, and supposedly they uh, address the topics that are of concern at that time. So the topic of concern at that time, or at least the one for my segment of the three days, was why isn't Wall Street helping Main Street? And so I, after I asked them if they really meant to have me there, as opposed to someone who um, actually supported uh, Wall Street. Um, they said, yes, we want you there. We want to hear your opinion. So I uh, go to Washington, and I speak after Janet Yellen, who is the former chair of the Federal Reserve, spoke and addressed everyone. And this is all internal. It's all central bankers from around the world. Um, and she speaks to the room full of them and says, we're at a position now where things are, are fine, the banking system is healthy, everything's all good, all these policies have worked. And I'm looking around the room, I'm sitting kind of at the side, and you know, she's in the front, I'm waiting to talk, and there's this feeling of, we don't quite feel we're on the same page as you, Janet Yellen, um, from, from some of the central bankers in the room. Um, and they tended to be the central bankers, as I found out, from the smaller central banks around the world that aren't sort of controlling um, or influencing or depositing into the financial system lots and lots of money. They're sort of on the sidelines having to sort of deal with the ramifications. Um, but anyway, she says everything's fine. Then a couple of people get up from the Treasury Department um, and they, they're even more enthusiastic about how, how, how great all of the last eight years have been. There's been more regulations, everything's fine, banks are good, economy's healthy. Um, we've got this. And then this cardinal talks. Um, he had just been at the Vatican and he comes and he doesn't talk about monetary policy or finance or anything like that. He just looks at the room full of bankers, kind of addresses the more senior ones, and he says, do you remember the thing about helping the poor? <laughs> and again, sort of uncomfortability in the room. And I stand up and I say, look, uh, the question you have for me um, for this conversation right now today is why isn't Wall Street helping Main Street? So I just say, look, it's really simple. You never made them. You never required anything from these banks that you have subsidized for, at that time, eight years at all. You never said, well, if we give you trillions of dollars of fabricated money, that you have to forgive some student debt, or you have to restructure some more mortgages, or you have to give an additional amount of small business loans, or you have to set aside a bunch for infrastructure development. We, we, we never told you to do any of that. Um, so I said, so what, 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 what did you expect? Um, but the narrative then and now is that what the central banks have done, in particular the Federal Reserve, is that it's helped the economy. The economy is all fine. Um, and, and I think we know that it's not really all fine. It's fine for the people who got the money. So let me step back, you know, as, as it is. So let me step back. Um, so what's a central bank? What's, what's, what's the real point? And there are many of a central bank. Um, in honor of Yanis's book coming out, a central bank is kind of like a parent who has money or can find money when a sort of bad child, <laughs> or sort of child that's running amok, um, you know, drinking too much, doing drugs, ruining the car, etc., keeps coming back and asking for money to go out and do the next thing. Um, and the parent keeps on saying, yeah, okay, fine. So you need money for this. You know, you shouldn't really do drugs. Yeah, okay, I won't. Can I have money for something? No, here's some more money. You really shouldn't drink. You shouldn't drink and drive. You shouldn't do any of the things you're doing, but you know what? We're going to keep on providing you the money to do that. And, and that's how the central bank has behaved, because what the Fed has done over the last 10 years, in particular in the wake of the financial crisis, is to provide a blank check effectively, an unlimited sum of money, in an unregulated manner, by people that are unelected, um, sort of 
four and a half trillion dollars, just the Fed, that's a very big number, um, which is still on offer right now, to have the banks become healthy again to enable them to have money again to continue doing what they were doing before the financial crisis, to use that money to buy their own stock, to use that money uh, to enhance their own CEOs and chair people, and not to use the money to do any, things that, any of the things that were at the crux of that question that day uh, to help Main Street. Now, it's not their job, but it is the Fed's job, theoretically, to regulate the banking system. And so when the banking system goes off the rails, um, you know, when, 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 a, when a kid is going off the rails and it's the job of a good parent to turn in and say, look, that's not okay. Um, things need to change. You can't continue to be like that. But that's not what the Federal Reserve did. Instead, they came in and they said, don't worry, we've got this. Now, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, and it was the result of a panic, and I talked about this in my last book, so I won't go too far on on this, um, that happened in New York in 1913, where a bunch of spec um, in 1907, where a bunch of speculators rigged the copper market, and they got caught out. They made some bad bets. They were starting to lose money, but they were attached to banks that had real people's deposits in them, and those real people got very concerned that the top of their banks were losing money, and they started walking into the lobbies of those banks and they started standing outside in the pavement and they started walking on the sidewalks and they started getting beaten up by cops at the time and there was like mass chaos in New York because these banks had bet wrong, they had people's money and people wanted their money out. And it looked bad, it was cosmetically bad and J.P. Morgan who was the head banker at the time in the world and in New York was concerned because to an extent all the people were involved in all of the banks. The, the more sort of powerful people at the larger banks, but it just didn't look good cosmetically for anyone else. So he goes to Teddy Roosevelt, who was the president at the time, he says, look, I can fix this. I need some money from the Treasury Department. So the first bailout of the banking system happened in 1907. It was $25 million. It was the Treasury Department giving the money to J.P. Morgan and saying, look, you just figure it out. Just, just fix it. Help the banks. You don't help the banks. Whatever you do, just fix it, make it go away. And he took the $25 million, he gave it to his friends, he let other banks fail. Um, and at the end of that, he was still concerned going forward that, you know, perhaps if there is another panic like this for whatever reason, it was kind of stressful to have to figure out what to do. And what if the Treasury Department doesn't have the money? And so he and, and other bankers, um, he was dead by the time that the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 came out, but at the time and over the years from 1907 through 1913, discussed how to get together and create a Federal Reserve system, an insurance policy, a parent for the banking system so that they wouldn't have to ask the president for money or ask the treasury department for money or count on Congress to vote to give them money. There was just a, a place that could literally create money that they could use in the event of an emergency. And the way it was sold to the people of the United States in 1913 when the act was passed by Woodrow Wilson um, was kind of like how it's being sold now. History does repeat. And the way it was sold was if the Federal Reserve exists, and there's a problem on Wall Street, and money needs to go out to the farmers in the middle of the country or the people building up the western part of the country, and it's not flowing west, which is kind of how a lot of that money was going. There's a place, and there's 12 banks within the Federal Reserve System located in San Francisco and Dallas and Richmond and New York and so forth that'll sort of handle the problems and make sure that money goes through and it's liquid. There's a lot of water terms in finance. It goes through to wherever it needs to go and that was how it was sold. Um, the other way it was sold in what's in the Federal Reserve Act is that it's supposed to maintain a stable financial system, be the regulator, ensure there's something called full employment, which has changed in sort of what that really means over the years and over time anyway. Um, and that inflation or the level of price increases is, is kept at a level of, of 2%. And the other thing it was supposed to do is in an emergency, and there was a clause in the Federal Reserve Act, it was the lender of last resort. In an emergency, it would be there to provide money for the system. So in 2008, there's a big emergency in that all of these banks have effectively ruined the system. They've lost a lot of money, they've committed a lot of crimes, and the entire global economy is suffering because of that. Because countries like Mexico and Greece and, and even uh, areas like Puerto Rico, regions like Puerto Rico, were all doing okay before the financial crisis. They were balancing incoming and outgoing money in terms of their own areas. Um, and when the financial crisis happened, it had a very, very quick effect everywhere. 
because the U.S. banks were connected to banks everywhere, the Federal Reserve, because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world, was kind of the, the parent of parent central banks throughout the world and had to ensure that money throughout the world kept moving. Um, and so where collusion comes into play, um, and it's not about Russia, um, it's not about Mueller, but it's, it, it's, it's about the fact that the, the crisis was actually so much bigger than it even appeared at the time that it required the major other central banks in the world to work together to ensure there was enough money in an emergency for the financial system to continue to operate and for it not to close its doors, um, for, for ATMs not to stop giving money to depositors, and all the reasons that were sort of given to the world as to why it was necessary for all this money to be fabricated and given to the financial system. Um, and so the European Central Bank, which is the head central bank of, of the uh, European Union, the Bank of Japan in Japan, to a lesser extent, the Bank of England in the UK, um, and basically the G7 central, uh, central bank, banks all kind of worked on this same policy and they're all sort of like taking direction from the Federal Reserve because the other thing the Federal Reserve didn't want to have happen and U.S. major banks didn't want to have happen is for money to leave the U.S. And so when the Fed started making money available at very cheap interest rates or zero percent, which is like no percent, <laughs> um, to the banking system, which, you know, now it's a little bit higher than that, but effectively, globally, it's still 0% on average to the banking system. Um, it, was, it was partly a way to try and just fix the problems in the books of these banks that they knew were still going on. Um, and and in or if you give enough money to a problem at some point, um, it's, it's going to look like the problem is not necessarily solved, but that it, you don't have to worry about it anymore. It's like if you're at a blackjack table and you're losing hand after hand after hand in some casino and someone next to you is giving you 100 bucks for the next hand and 100 bucks for the next hand, eventually you're going to win a couple hands. Um, and if you're given enough money, you can play at enough tables that at some point you're winning somewhere. Um, and that was one of the points of what the Federal Reserve did in a policy that had never been, to the extent it currently exists, and to the extent it has grown over the years, been so much of a subsidy for these banks. So when I talk about trillions of dollars here and here, it's kind of, they're unimaginable, they're, they're big numbers. Um, but if you think about it like this, the amount of money, the trillions of dollars that have been manufactured to help the banking system in an emergency situation that has now apparently gone on for a 10-year emergency, that's a really long emergency or that's a really unhealthy financial system, um, is about $21 trillion. Now, today, now it's been more and less and stuff over the 10 years, but, but, but currently, um, that's what's been fabricated and is still like on offer to subsidize the financial system. Now, that is about the size of the GDP of all the goods and services of the United States. That's basically like saying there's two United States out there. There's one that's kind of here, and then there's one that's subsidizing the financial system. And when the Fed has these meetings and these central bankers get together, like, like in the slides there and all these places around the world as they do in Davos, Switzerland and in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and all the places they get together to discuss whatever the problem of that year happens to be and however it is they're going to solve it, the net result over the last 10 years is whatever they're talking about, there's a credit crisis in 2012 in Europe. You know, there, there's, there's problems with Greece in, in, in 2011. There's issues with um, China in 2016. Whatever it might be, they get together, and the solution to it all is we need to continue um, to the euphemism is print more money. They're not really printing money. It's, it's more sophisticated. They're electronically providing money. Um, and they're not requiring anything in exchange for it, and they're not asking for it back. So it's like you go to your ATM machine, and you think you have a balance of $100, and all of a sudden you have a balance of like a million dollars. Right? That would be nice. It would be nice if that happened. I mean, if you took, you know, trillions of dollars and you divided it out, not even necessarily per person, but, you know, it, per things that could be useful to, to growing the real economy, um, that, that's a healthy sum. And what happens in finance, what happens in banking, um, is if there's a certain amount of money available, it allows for other things to happen as sort of byproducts of just existing. And so if there's $21 trillion of money available that has gone into buying bad mortgage assets from the U.S. banks or buying certain very selected corporations' 
uh, in uh, bonds in the European Union or stocks in Japan. All of these things are choices that these central banks make as to who to help, and then the other side of that is who they're not helping. And so the result of having all this money go into certain pockets of countries and certain pockets of financial assets is that there's a greater inequality that, that, that comes from, from just that fact. So while regular people aren't getting interest on their deposits, um, these banks are getting cheap money with which to buy their own stock. So if you look at just the big six banks in the United States because of this policy, um, they have been able to, among other things, have a record quarter this past quarter. Um, they also saved an extra $3.6 billion collectively because of the tax cuts they needed so badly. Um, they have increased all of the pay for, for their CEOs substantially. Um, and they have not really raised the interest rates on people's savings accounts. In fact, a regular person who, let's say, has $1,000 of a deposit at a bank like J.P. Morgan Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America or Citigroup is probably paying about 20 bucks a month for the honor of keeping their money with these banks, for which they're receiving close to nothing in interest, which means they're paying 24% interest to banks to keep their money. Now, banks are paying almost nothing on interest to receive much more money than that from the Federal Reserve. So when they go and they buy their own stock, um, and that looks good for their shareholders, they have an option to not buy their own stock and to use it to basically give to their customers to increase their, you know, reduce their fees, increase their deposits, restructure some of their loans, wh whatever could be done if this was a, for a totally different system or if the Fed made them um, do what was the problem behind that question, if they made Wall Street help Main Street. And when I say Wall Street, I mean collectively banks throughout the world. It just so happens that the Wall Street banks were the sort of miscreants that the sort of the, the mouth of the financial crisis, and they continue to do what they've been doing since then, just from now a higher height and with more subsidies. And as I said before, that has ramifications throughout the world. I'm going to go very quickly, because I am um, throughout the world now, because I uh, wrote collusion out in the world. Um, I traveled to different regions, and I specifically picked those regions because they re represented um, different results of this particular policy. They were either collusive with the policy, they tried to be and couldn't, they had political problems because they tried to be and couldn't, um, and smaller countries had to deal with helping their own economies and, and, a, and a policy that worked for them internally, but then there was flack from the US and so forth, and so they, they just represent different things. Um, Mexico was the first place I went to, and we spent a lot of time there. These, these were not the first times I went to any of these places, um, but to, to, to sort of dig into this. And I had a breakfast in Monterrey, Mexico, which is the third largest, in, it's in, sort of in the industrial city in Mexico, one morning after, soon after the Janet Yellen experience in Washington. And I was sitting next to a former senior member of the Central Bank of Mexico um, who had left in 2008. He actually left as the crisis was the beginning. And most countries didn't think the crisis was going to become the crisis. And I have a lot of this documentation in the book. Most of them thought this, this, this you know, this is a blip, this is bad, but we're going to weather this. We have nothing to do with these banks. You know, this is, this is not us. But then, of course, as the banks started hurting the economy and money started getting put into different places, it started to creep into all of these other countries that have relationships with the U.S., that had to deal with the fallout of, of a basically a recession or a depression here. Um, and so he said that at the time they were talking, they were, they were looking at sort of Washington um, and hoping that they would pick a different direction from what they did. So instead of providing money and sort of a reward um, for all the bad things banks had done, you know, sort of maybe beat them back, do something to them, regulate them, make it sort of better for the future. Um, and and uh, they actually, some of the individuals, I have a whole character um, list in the book because you, it's hard to keep track of all these people. They float around from country to country. There's a lot of names in the book, so there's a little glossary of names. Um, but, but this one person I'm, I, I thought was very uh, critical to the meaning of the giving money in the face of a crisis, Guillermo Ortiz, who was the head of the Central Bank of Mexico when the crisis hit. Um, and he went up to Washington and he said to Ben Bernanke, who was the chair of the Fed at the time, look, um, if you are going to do what I think you're going to do, then that's going to ultimately decrease confidence in the system, not increase it for the regular people, and that's going to ultimately you know, come back to haunt you. And Ben Bernanke, of course, completely ignored him, did not even mention him in his memoirs. I had to actually buy the memoirs to make sure the electronic copy I had that did not mention this guy's name or any of the central bankers that warned um, that there could be ultimate problems from this particular policy in the very beginning. 
um, were, were completely ignored. So Ortiz actually winds up not being reappointed to run the Central Bank of Mexico in the next time he's, he's up for that position because he was openly critical um, of what the U.S. was doing. He did go on the circuit. He is still involved in sort of the... Um, he actually is an advisor now to the Dallas Fed. So these people do sort of recycle, but he did try to warn um, as to what would happen. And the second head of the Central Bank of Mexico, Augustin Carstens, started out saying, and that's why he got the position, I, I agree with Ben Bernanke. He, he became sort of a public mouthpiece down south um, for, for, for Bernanke. And, uh, and at some point he realized this was going to be bad for Mexico. So they tried to follow the same policies as the Fed. They made money cheap. That increased inflation in Mexico because in Mexico, inflation actually was related to this policy because the central bank was closer to actual people than the central bank here is to people in our country. Um, and ultimately, he got disillusioned as well. Um, and he wound up quitting. Well, he quit once Trump was elected. But he wound up quitting um, and going to run the Bank of the International Settlements, which is... Um, which is in Europe, which was created um, ultimately to be the central bank of central banks and that it has all the information, it looks at all the reports. And for the most part, for decades, it was created in 1931, it was a cheerleader of any policy any Fed would do, any ECB would do, any, any central bank would do anywhere. But even it became critical, and its reports now have gone from um, being very comforting to being very critical of a policy that's basically dumped a lot of money into the market, required nothing from it, um, dumped a lot of money into the stock market, been that sort of fuel for, for very risky policies without any sort of request to restructure. Um, and now there is this shift in the world, and this is actually the positive part of the book, um, of countries like Mexico, of countries actually even like China, who've actually questioned this policy of the United States and are trying to develop alternatives where if money is being fabricated, it's at least being fabricated for real growth and real infrastructure and real development and real people and real bridges and real trains and so forth, which ours is not. Um, I spend a lot of time, probably too much time in Washington, talking to um, people of Congress on, on both sides of the aisle about financial issues. Um, and, and my, I, I don't work for a bank, obviously, anymore, so I'm, I'm really talking um, about this from the perspective of just sound policy, just, just sensible things, and it is not sensible to reward bad behavior. It's not, it's not a good economic policy ultimately, and that's what we're really dealing with over the last 10 years. And the fact that it also creates inequality and it reduces the amount of savings people get and reduces what pension funds can be worth in the future, and then all, these, all this blame um, gets stirred up at the sort of bottom of the economy, and that's kind of going back to the video. All this, so you blame the immigrants, blame terrorists, blame workers, blame, blame those you know, lazy people in Greece who weren't working hard enough to like, uh, maintain a balanced budget there. Just, just, just outwardly shove the blame where there has been this massive trickle-down narrative policy that is not being pushed by the Republicans or the conservatives or, or whatever, any political party. It's being manufactured by central banks. They have larger checkbooks today than they've ever had before. Um, and, and they work together to basically promote that. So in Europe, um, where, where I went all over as well, uh, it was a real choice to not help Greece obviously, and there was a power choice in that. But it works even worse, it looks even more foul when the European Central Bank actually has surpassed the Federal Reserve in terms of fabricating money over the last 10 years. So Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve is at four and a half trillion. The European Central Bank is somewhere between five and five and a half trillion. And they choose every day where they look at the money that they're continuing to manufacture, 30 billion to 60 billion euros a month. They choose where that goes. And they choose not to put it into Greece. And they choose not to put it into small corporations in, say, Portugal or Italy. They choose to put it into Germany. They choose to put it um, in, in, in Belgium. They choose to put it where they want to. But it's not like this is money that, are, that, that has been um, earned. This is money that they make up. And, and, and the thing that just really gets me about all of this work and just all of, you know, so going all around the world, it's a very dour subject. Um, it, it's really hard to make it um, light. It's not light. Um, but what it is, is it's, it's, it's just so frustrating. It'd be one thing if there wasn't an avenue to create money when money was needed in an emergency situation. But not only is this avenue been sort of rejiggered to be so, so generous, to so, so subsidize the financial system, um, it just makes all the problems that are that it creates that much worse. 
because that choice happens every day. It's a choice that the Federal Reserve is sitting on four and a half trillion dollars of subsidies that it provided the banking system, including one and a half trillion dollars worth of mortgages, two and a half or more trillion dollars of US treasuries. It has bought and given money to the banking system in return for buying those assets cheaply. And that debt's not getting used anywhere. The treasury bonds aren't getting used anywhere. We're supposed to borrow money to do things. That's not what's happening. It's sitting on the Fed's books. The mortgages that were still toxic 10 years ago, um, some of those assets are still sitting on the Fed's books. Um, and, and, and corporations that are failing in Europe and stock is, yeah, companies that are not doing as well in Japan, there is money for that. But there's not money for sort of the basic um, foundation of the economy. And, and that's where this is just such a crime. So some people ask um, you know, why I picked the word collusion, and I'll finish with that and open it to you for questions. But collusion, according to Google, I was actually at Google today. Um, I found out that at Google, um, they have like a, an arts and crafts sort of woodworking area. So it's like in between working, you can, you can go and like, you know, make things. <laughs> Which I actually thought that was cool. But um, anyway, so, so on Google, the, the, um, if, if you look at different definitions for collusion, um, it's basically it talks about, you know, a secret or an elite sort of group of people that are committing fraud or criminal behavior or whatever. And one of the words is also deceit. Um, so I look at it like this is an elite group of people. Um, the people at the head of central banks, they're not elected, they're, they're generally appointed. They sort of go back and forth between the private sector um, and each other's central banks, depending on who they are and how high they are. They pop out and they get lots of money for making speeches, um, as, as one does when they come out of places like Washington and sort of, you know, sort of richer uh, cities throughout the world. Um, and, the, and they manufacture money. Um, and then in all of the narratives about the manufacturing that money, they talk about how it's helped with growth. And it hasn't really helped with growth by definition because it is sitting on their books. It's, it's not even like logical um, to assume it has trickled down somewhere into growth. Yes, stock markets are higher, but if there's an availability of money to one group of, of, of institutions to use to buy their own stock, and banks actually have to ask the Fed if it's okay to buy their own stock, and the Fed has to say either yes or no, and it always says yes, well, then they buy their own stock and it goes up. So that, that's not an indicator of health. That's just, that's just an indicator of money. Um, and and, and so, so, so I find that that's kind of the, the biggest deceit in all of this. And, and the, the deceit is that this policy, this 10 years of emergency policy, has somehow funneled in to the major economy. And I'll finish on that with I was on CNBC on Friday. And I don't know if you, have, and you saw this, it's, um, it was cut short because Trump was talking about something in the beginning of the segment. And um, so it was a short segment. Um, and it was me and some hedge fund guy. And um, we were talking about wages. And the topic was, not unlike Wall Street not helping Main Street, but it was sort of like, why aren't wages going up um, as much if the stock market is up so high? Like, what's going on? What's the deal with that? Um, and wages had increased by 0.1% last month. That would be like nothing, right? This, <laughs> Now, the, the top six banks put in record quarters over that period of time. They, they bought lots of their own stock. Their stock went, lots of other things happened. Um, so, so we're talking about this, and, and I'm explaining that this, this money didn't go into wages. It's gone into stocks. And the guy on the other side is saying, yeah, but Apple just announced an $100 billion stock buyback, and they announced higher bonuses. And I'm like, well, bonuses and wages are just so not the same thing. Um, bonuses are like this portion of stock goes into your pocket, and wages are like the thing you actually have to count on to live on, and it hasn't moved. Um, but the thing was, he got the last argument. So the way it worked on the media was he said something first. He was asked a question first about this. I responded something like what I just told you. And then he basically said, no, you're wrong. And that's how the segment was cut, right? And I don't do that. You know, I'm sitting there. You know, I wasn't, you know, you're in a chair. You're looking at a camera. You know, you, you have no control over or any of that. And then when the segment was actually put out on Google, online, it, it said something like, our wage is going up. And that was the title of the segment. So, so, so also, there's a lot of other factors in terms of continuing to spin this narrative that don't sort of bear out. Um, in the real data. So, so ultimately, um, what my book is about is looking at how this collusion of fabricating money has impacted um, countries throughout the world, who's been doing what when. Um, every single chapter in every geography kind of starts with 
the crisis in 2008 and goes through to, to today, or basically when I hand it in the book, so sort of like recently, um, and then goes back. So you're constantly looking at that, this 10-year period from a different perspective around the world, and so hopefully that provides, um, if, you, if you read the book, a, a, um, just, just, just a composite of what's, what's happening, because we are actually all in this together. Um, the Fed has sort of been the dominant parent um, in terms of providing financing to the system, but ultimately um, th this is a world in which there are many ramifications everywhere, and we are in that um, together, and so that's really how I positioned it. In terms of solutions, which I end with um, to this, there's, there's lots of things that could be done, um, just in terms of financial policy in the United States, and, and, and those of you who know my work, I, I am a big advocate of, of Glass-Steagall reenactment, of, of separating the deposits and the loans from everything else that banks do, including now buying their own stock with lots and lots of money from the Fed. Um, and, and having at least some sort of stability at that level of the system, reducing their size, how many uh, deposits and assets they can have as a percentage of what's available um, in our country and in countries throughout the world. Um, if we do this here and we do it in other places, um, to have central banks, um, if, they, if they exist, to do their actual job, which is regulating uh, financial institutions, not sort of rewarding them for bad behavior, and certainly not having unlimited um, unaudited check writing capabilities that they have right now. Um, having the people who run these banks actually elected rather than appointed so that they're accountable to the public because their policies affect the public. Um, and actually canceling a lot of the debt that's been created in the wake of the financial crisis throughout the world um, that has been created in, in countries um, and by smaller companies that have required, uh, that are required to do that to basically borrow because they're not really recipients of the sort of big money that's coming from the top and, and sort of creating a more stable environment from that perspective and taking some of the money that's on offer and ensuring that it goes into development and infrastructure and wages and reduction of student loans and everything else that it could go for, which could actually do what all of these central banks have promised their policies will do, which is really promote real growth on real sort of Main Street and the equivalent of Main Street throughout the world. So I'm going to open it to questions from you guys um, on that. Thank you for listening. Um, yeah, um, my name is Dick Burkhardt, and I've been a critic of economics for a long time. And recently I've been reading about um, modern monetary theory. You know, Warren Mosler and Randall Ray and in England, Mary Mellor. And they see a real positive... Uh, opportunity, if you can print money, so to speak, to actually uh, not send it off to Wall Street, but to have, for the federal government, to have a full employment process, policy where they could be the employer of last resort. And do you think there's any hope or any strategy where we could get to something like that, sort of totally transform what the Fed is actually dedicated to? Well, I, I think there's always hope, and I do agree with that strategy. I mean, the idea is that if the Fed wasn't able to create all of this money, and, and other central banks weren't able to create all of this money because they just can, um, but, but did it for a purpose that actually helps more people um, or funds more jobs or funds more equality, um, I think that would be a really good use of that money. Um, that's not the philosophy under which these people are operating, and that's the problem. You know, Janet Yellen leaves her position as chair of the Fed, and the first place she goes is to get like a six-figure speeching gig on, in Tribeca, basically just off of Wall Street. So she's basically making in an hour or whatever, you know, what she made in almost a year running the Fed. So, so there's an incentive to kind of keep the status quo going. But, but, but I do agree, and this, this comes from the people, and it's actually also coming from the, some of the, I talk about this in the book, um, some of the developed nations as well, that there's, there, there's also a lot of anxiety and, and, and sort of criticism coming from major countries um, throughout the world, like the BRICS countries getting together and so forth and saying, look, you know, there has to be an alternative um, to this kind of policy, um, and, and perhaps collectively between shifts in geopolitics and also from individuals, we can get there. So yeah, there's hope. Um, and, and it makes it, it makes economic sense. Um, so my question's on MMT as well. Um, Stephanie Kelton was Bernie Sanders' chief economic advisor, and she's a big MMT person, along with Michael Hudson and Randy Ray. Mm -hmm. And she's, there's a talk now about going for a guaranteed um, full employment, mm -hmm. and the money could be printed, it would not be borrowed, it would not be inflationary, mm -hmm. and you could eliminate unemployment and also address health care, green mm -hmm. economy. 
with Bernie's proposal out right now for full employment, the question people are asking is how to pay for it, and there's not a public understanding of MMT mm -hmm. and that that is mm -hmm. a way to finance it. Mm -hmm. Is that a role for people like yourself and other economists maybe to get the public to know that this option, which is current, right. is actually much more feasible than people think? Um, yeah, I, I agree with that, and I've actually, some of the same people I've talked to um, on the Hill about Glass-Steagall, um, and including working with you know, you know, various people on both sides of the aisle, is to do an infrastructure kind of situation, or not, so, you know, a, a program, sets of programs where you take the debt that's already there, so you take the money that's already printed, and you start with that, you take the electronic digits that have already been added, and you say, look, the Fed has four and a half trillion dollars of subsidies right now, you cut off a trillion, you cut off a trillion and a half, and that becomes the base, the collateral, because most of it's government guaranteed, some of it's junky mortgages, you take the good parts, and that becomes the base for using money for those other programs, for helping to, so you're not, the, the, the cool thing about it is because there's been such an inflated amount of money created already, that that idea can actually start with literally diverting it literally using what's already there as the base for those, those ideas. And I, I think that's the way to do it. You don't even have to start with anything new. You can start with what's already there. If the European Central Bank, for example, can print 30 to $60 billion every month, just, just don't have it go into like tech corporations in Germany or wherever, you know, have it go into things that are real. But MMT would actually bypass the private banks and be more direct. No, no, that's what I'm saying. It's the, 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 the central bank is already there providing money to the, to the banks. What I'm saying is you basically take back the provision. You still have the debt on your book already. You still purchase these treasuries from the private banks, but you redeploy them. They already are there. They're already on the Fed's books to start something like a public bank, something like an infrastructure, a national bank, that you bypass the private banking system and you have more of a public banking system, but it is funded by debt that's already created. So there's no new debt. Not the same, okay. Yeah. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you. So I'm a kid from Brooklyn, New York. I used to play softball <laughs> I'm from New York. with, I used to play softball with Lloyd Blankfein. Ah. He was a kid who lived in the projects of East New York, mm -hmm. a place called the Linden Projects. Mm -hmm. I knew him very well as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I found him to he's be a, a CEO I, he's a, and chairman of he's Goldman a, Sachs. He's a chairman of Goldman Sachs. He's also a criminal, unfortunately. Right. When uh, when the whole board of uh, directors, Diamond of Chase Manhattan Bank. So in uh, in 1978, when I graduated Brooklyn College, I became a headhunter, and I was working uh, specifically with Chase Manhattan Bank, a bunch of banks. Merrill Lynch was one of my clients, and I got very lucky because a few years later, I read an article in Banker and Brokerage uh, Magazine. And I saw the little company in the penthouse of uh, 90 West Street, which is right across from the Trade Center, mm -hmm. across Liberty, across Albany. There was a little church in the parking lot called St. Nicholas that went down during 9-11, by the way. Uh, uh, yeah, 9-11. Anyway, um, the luck that I had was I read a, a, a little article about banks needing PhDs in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So luckily, I had the money. I had a contract with the New York Times for $25,000, and I wrote an ad every, every week in the any technology train Wall Street. So I made a lot of millionaires out of a lot of young people coming out of MIT and, and uh, Columbia University. They were getting jobs in managing directors, by managing directors, doing quantitative research. They'd make mm -hmm. 75, 80,000 their first year, 100 and a quarter the next year, 150 the following year with a three to five million dollar bonus. The things that I really think I'd love you to, to address in another book, I've not read who you are, but I found out who you are, and I'm here. A couple of things. The derivative security market did not accidentally fall. It fell by a bunch of criminals that changed the game. Because when derivative securities market started, a bank would take 10 mortgages, let's say at $100,000 a piece. They would get, let's say, 20% down on that. So they'd have $200,000, right? And it was AAA mortgage. So a guy who took a mortgage out, I'll, I'll leave in a second, I'm sorry, but would take a mortgage out and they were guaranteed to pay that 15 or 20 year. Then they started goofing around with the tranches, right? So it's not, it's not really the central bank, I don't believe. I believe it's the criminals on the street that have never been accountable well, the, I, for the I, crimes. I, That's all I have to I'm say. I'm just saying I'd like you to you. address that. Yes. Well, I. I so, you know, um, one of my books did address that. 
Um, it was called It Takes a Pillage. Okay. I love the and title of that. I love the title <laughs> yes, of that. Um, and that book actually goes into a lot of what you're talking about, right. which is sort of all the criminal manufacturing and remanufacturing of, of really creating fake securities and sort of and, selling and, them. And real. But yeah. what the central banks have done and where this book actually follows from that, right. um, and certainly um, those people committed crimes, they paid billion, hundreds of billions what of dollars What about Geithner who paid crimes? a dollar and a dollar, you know what I'm saying? It, exactly. Yeah. This, that what's happened since then, um, which is why this period actually is almost more scary, is there's these other entities, the central banks that have come in and validated all of that, that have basically created a whole new pool of money to subsidize the institutions that committed these crimes and sort of lied to investors and faked the integrity of their securities, um, and in many cases copped to felonies. J J JP Morgan, as, a, as an institution, settled on, on a felony charge of, of rigging um, one of the rates that actually determines the cost of money, um, called LIBOR, separate other longer conversation. Right. So, so the central banks, though, the, the piece that they play is that they validate, right. they subsidize, and they're continuing to subsidize. I was and happy what you said about the glass deal, because a lot of people probably right. don't know what that is. Right. And so that was, so my, my biggest client was MetLife. Right. They had $136 billion in assets. They said to me, it's going to change. You're going to need PhDs. And I was right. very fortunate to right. be in that so game. Anyway, thank right you time. so much. You're you welcome. Know. Thank you for your remarks. Hello, Ron Paul and others have uh, tried to uh, pass an audit the Fed bill. Right. Yes. Do you think if there was a true audit of the Fed and the populace saw where all the trillions were going, that it might end the Fed? And would that be a good thing? I think that um, actually Ron Paul and Bernie Sanders um, got together in, in uh, 20, well, in, in a few years after the, the financial crisis to talk about the idea of auditing the Fed. And so this idea came from sort of the left and the right, basically came from different sides of, of Washington. And um, I was actually on the Federal Reserve Advisory Committee of Bernie Sanders at the time and the conversations that we had um, with respect to how that should look together. Um, is that auditing the Fed, um, actually disclosing what the money was going and where it was going and, and what it was doing um, would at least be a way to get the public involved with um, understanding this, this, this whole sort of murky um, concept. And, um, and that didn't really go anywhere in Washington <laughs> um, because... Why? Um, yeah, for, for a lot of reasons, but one of the major reasons um, was that the Federal Reserve has really preserved the system. It's preserved the status quo. People from the Bush administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Clinton have all been engaged in some semblance of keeping the status quo, where there is that um, body here and other similar bodies throughout the world that's there uh, to grease the wheels of a crisis, to provide money when money is needed. The difference now... Um, and even since the audit, the Fed conversations had been brought up and sort of ignored is that the amount um, has just gone on steroids in terms of what's available. I think we do need to audit the Fed. The Fed thinks that just showing its books, it has reports every week. You can look at them and they, they, they show just no one really, you know, you're doing other things. It's fair not to pay attention, but they actually show the balance of the Fed and how it's increased over the months. And you can go back um, through every week since the financial crisis and see it moving. Um, and what you'll see is their uh, electronically create, creating money, um, which they call quantitative easing, which sounds so elegant and wonky, um, you know, just, just has a straight line on top of where the stock market is going. You know, they create more that day, the stock market goes up that day, they back off, it goes, I mean, you can really see um, the data, um, but you should be able to see where, where it specifically goes um, and, and what it does, and I do think that would be useful. But there's not much hope of that anytime soon, it sounds like. In not under this in particular Congress. Fed, unfortunately. Um, you know, um, I have a question, but first I'd like to say that I recognize that we don't use money nowadays. Uh, we haven't used money for quite a while, and we do have currency, that's correct. Money is currency as well, but there's other forms of currency, and the Federal Reserve note is a currency. And our money, the people's money was stripped away from us in the 30s and in the, in the 70s, or in the 60s. <clears throat> and uh, I was wondering... Um, you know, these people that would like to control our money system, they've been at it for centuries. And they finally was able to do it to, they, they kind of got a partnership with government because government helps to enforce what they put together in institution-wise, institution which is the Federal Reserve System and other central banks. And we don't use their 
their form of currency, then we are penalized and the government will enforce it because we can't pay our taxes other than by use of their currency. Now, um, can you explain to us what the original intent of our founders when they set up the, the, uh, uh, the Money System Act in 1792, which hasn't been repealed, and why that still isn't in effect today, and why we have these people who have monopolized the um, manufacture of currency for our use, why they have been permitted to continue to do so. Um, well, I, I, I do start later in, in history, but, 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 but what has happened um, is that it's, 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 it's even more publicly disclosed. Like it's, it's actually not as dark even as, as, as we can think of it um, in terms of how the Fed um, or other central banks create currency or create money into the financial system. The, the, they, they do. They do create dollars. If there's a shortage in dollars, they create dollars. They do create a currency and they do provide dollars to other central banks in order to be used when there's emergencies because the central banks um, collectively at this point um, have more dollars than any other security, so if there are any other currency. So if there is a problem, that's what gets manufactured. That, that's what gets traded around. If a currency is having problems, like if the peso um, is, is being demolished because of you know, trade war conversations or just simply because of an economic crisis, um, then the central bank in Mexico can decide to, uh, to back its own currency, um, and, it, and it does that by effectively um, selling dollars and buying its own currency. So there's always a sort of manipulation um, around uh, but, it, but it's, it's public. I mean, this, this is actually things that are, that are, that are seeable. Um, so we are involved in that system. That is what we use. Um, and therefore, we have to be aware of where that money is being created, what that money is being created for, um, and where it's going, so that we actually can um, try to push for policies that actually get us away from the risk of creating that money to plaster over uh, crises and so forth. But I think the 72 yeah. thing might be another book. But so do you agree then um, that money should be managed? Uh, you know, Jefferson warned us uh, that uh, if the banks and corporations were to instit institutionalize the creation of money, that we would f have uh, people in the future be homeless. And that's well, what's there, happening there, even today. There has certainly been the, 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 the more that fewer people control or use or accumulate wealth or money, the greater the inequality throughout the world. And so that's one of the things that, that I'm addressing here, and I've addressed another work with respect to banks, is that, yes, they, they were not wrong. It is not wrong to say that if there are certain bodies that accumulate more of the wealth, that inequality is produced from that, and that ultimately does create more homeless, it creates more poverty, it creates less stability economically. Um, so that, that is happening. And what we have to do is be aware of it um, and, and push for policies and ways to get around that and sort of equate, um, bring equality back. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, thank you. My name is Doug Underwood. Uh, on the home front here in Seattle, where we are the, probably the most booming economic city in the country, uh, I, I, I've wondered about a comment that George Orwell once made about how hard it is for us to see kind of what's at the end of our nose. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you just your thoughts, central bank related, how it relates to the crash. Uh, uh, the reason that money is uh, ostensibly being kept so low is that inflation is so low. Uh, inflation in housing in Seattle uh, last year was 12.6 percent, mm -hmm. and I think it's been in going on double digits mm -hmm. uh, since almost since this recovery mm -hmm. started. Um, that has allowed money to flow into development, and the development here has been largely in condos and homes mm -hmm. at highly unaffordable prices, right. has driven people out of the city, right. and yet continually our monetary policy is based on the, on the argument that there is no inflation. Right. Uh, how does that tie in, ridiculous. and what, and what is going that, on? Yeah. It is Thank ridiculous, <laughs> that, and I'm glad you bring that up. I've had a question like yours, not that yours is not originally put. Um, but but in, in, in all the places that, that, that I've been talking about this, why is inflation um, 
official inflation, like, you know, a sort of general way that inflation is computed, because not going up. There's a lot of other factors. So, so there's a lot of inflation, though. There's inflation in real estate prices at the top. There's inflation in the stock market. There's inflation in the bond market. There's inflation in the cost of college. There's inflation in the cost of health care. Um, you know, there, there's inflation in rents. There's, there's a lot of inflation going on. So it isn't like the money that's gone into the system hasn't produced inflation. It just hasn't produced inflation as it's calculated by the people that run the Fed. <laughs> you know, and, and, and therefore, the official level of inflation and the benchmark, the sort of limit of inflation that central banks have decided needs to be achieved in order for them to stop what they're doing um, in terms of keeping the money um, sort of abundant for, um, for the system is, is a 2%. And we are not at 2% inflation except in like any of these measures. <laughs> um, and Europe is at like 0.7% inflation except if you look at any of these measures. If you look at the inflated gap between what wages are to what things cost, there's a lot of inflation that has increased over this time period. Um, and it's, it's, this is another one of these frustrating things that, 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 that central bankers um, are, are not connected to the actual real world when they talk, they can like sit there and say, well, as Mario Draghi just did last week when he was talking about European Central Bank policy of continuing to buy bonds there because inflation is so low, um, or in Japan where inflation has just been low forever. Um, but it's not like it's that low because people in Japan, um, even though it looks low, and if, we're, if you don't go to Japan, you think of it as, it's really expensive to do anything in Japan. You take a taxi like, you know, five minutes in Japan and it's like $60. I mean, it's, um, I'm upset, but, but it's very expensive. Little teeny tiny hotel rooms are very, very expensive. Rents are very expensive. People are living with their parents forever. There is inflation um, of prices, just not as central banks choose uh, to look at classical computations of inflation. That gives them the excuse to continue their policy. They're like, oh, it, it hasn't created inflation in 10 years, so we get to keep doing it. We should do it. We should do it because we need to have growth, and growth is measured by 2% inflation. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, have you looked at subway prices in New York? I mean, anything, literally anything. Um, there has been inflation. There just has been no inflation in the official narrative. Hey, but my Cheerios are still cheap. <laughs> yeah, but there's less in the box. I promise you. Yeah, you got me there. You <laughs> I got promise me there. You. They have... 12 and a half ounces, yeah. Um, you were talking about public banking, and I read about public banking because North Dakota has a public bank right. here in the United States, and I read the benefits that the public bank had. You know, it's that Main Street economy you're talking about. They loan the, all the people that need the loans, and then the <coughs> profits they make actually go back into the community. Right. So when I read about public banking, I realized there's really no need for private banks. Right. So when we get a right. system right. of right. public banks right. throughout the right. uh, country, right. I'm worried that there might not be a use for private, <laughs> for private banks. Bank. And they are more worried than you are. They are worried. They are really worried. Well, yeah, yes, actually, yes. Davos, no, I know you're not. Yes. Davos was talking about those things, too. Yes, no, I know. Um, they were not talking about advocating public banks, though. No, I they're mean, they're, being they're, worried. they're more worried about the collapse. They know what you know. But That's they, right. Yeah. right. They, they they're worried about the pitchforks. They see it different. Right. Um, so public banking, I, I think there was that. I'm, I'm going to create a question out of what you said. Right. What? Is that should we just have more public yeah, oh, banks? Wasn't I, yeah, yeah I said, this? well, what, okay. what do you, yeah, what do right. you see? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do you see private banks to do after we get a system of public banking? Well, I'm serious. It's a, it's a, no, it's no, no, answer, absolutely. Really. If we had a system of public banking, we would not need private banks. That Thank is you. true. That is absolutely true. Then, and this goes back to the companion of having, you wouldn't even, Glass-Steagall reinstatement or having public banks do public things, take deposits, give loans, you know, fund infrastructure, all that mm -hmm. sort of thing would be happening. Other banks... They could be private. They could continue to do you know, whatever speculation they do. They could create whatever they could. But when they fail, they don't have a Fed. They don't have an FDIC backing the deposits that back their transactions. They're just kind of on their own. And that's, that's fine. So public banks, um, but this is, this, is, this is a weird thing. So, so a lot of cities, um, well, Seattle's actually, some, 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 some people here are advocating public bank in a lot of places actually on the West. Um, Denver and so forth. There, there, there's places that are advocating and people that have movements of public banking institute and so forth that are advocating um, and, and doing real research to show why public banks do exactly what you said, which is they use public money for 
the public. It's, it's, it's really simple. Um, and when you say public money, is, it's our deposits. Um, it's our tax receipts. Um, and, it, it, and the idea is that they go into helping the locality. So North Dakota, for example, they go into providing cheaper um, student loans and therefore a cheaper cost of education in general um, for good university education in North Dakota. The idea is that they help on multiple levels um, the public. And if there's more of them doing that, yes. Now, that said, private banks really don't like that. And so there's a lot, a lot of lobbying against a few, few people that want public <laughs> banks by these really big institutions saying that public banks wouldn't know what they were doing. <laughs> As if, you know, Wells Fargo, who just like routinely steals money from its customers, <laughs> is somehow this, this, they know what they're doing. They, they know <laughs> what they're doing. Yeah, Tim Sloan got a 37% raise last year because um, they bought their own stock. Uh, so, so that would be a way, um, another way to, to reduce um, the risk and just sort of help grow the actual economy. And, and it, again, it also makes sense. Public banks, community uh, banks, credit unions, all of that, the obligation is to that locality, that state, that city. And the idea is that um, that money stays in a sort of foundational way. And the choice of where that money goes and what it helps is going into something that's real, that you can see, that if money goes to like the bar next door and the bartender goes and he buys you know, clothes for himself at the other local store next door and that person goes and you know, buys uh, whatever, you know, so on and on, on and on and on, but, but in a way that actually um, has people helping each other because they're financed uh, in an appropriate way and the money doesn't go into some crazy derivative to do whatever it does. Thank I you. agree. I think the uh, website is publicbankinginstitute.org. Thank yeah. you. Hi. Um, I've, I very much enjoyed the presentation, um, and I uh, was especially glad. I just want to say uh, your, your emphasis on the good happening in the world was, was really great. I work with um, Lyndon LaRouche, and we've been promoting the, uh, the, the Belt and Road of, of China as, a, as an alternative to the corruption of, of the, the transatlantic financial system as you've discussed very eloquently. What I wanted to um, raise or just kind of propose, I think you've, 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 uh, you've said more than I could ever say, but the idea of collusion struck me very nicely because you have this idea of central banks coming together away from the, the control of, of sovereign nation states to, to essentially run the world, to run governments, to run, to run economies. And it's, it's, it's a subtle shift, it's almost like a, it's a, it's a mental shift where you, the, the assertion of sovereignty is, is that you have nation states taking back their economies and, and public credit and banking institutions from that system. And what I wanted to, I, you know, hold on, I, so I wanna, I wanna ask her to comment on that idea because okay. we have a wonderful opportunity now for the United States China, other nations to come together around an actual new financial architecture, so to speak. So I think, in, is this now working? Yeah, this is working. Um, so I think in general, um, you know, as, as I talk about in the book, that, that the more that money is deployed into real development and, and, and real infrastructure and, and real workers and real wages, the more that economies anywhere and, and also, therefore, if they work together, can thrive sort of at what I call in the book a foundational economic level, um, at, at, at the, the sort of brick and mortar of the world, of the hierarchy, of the countries, of, the, of, of um, just what citizens can, can receive from, uh, from the, the fruits of real labor and, and, and real building and real development and long-term growth strategies. So to the extent that um, any country, um, and it is true, China is involved in, in, in a lot of funding for um, its choice for using its quantitative easing or its manufacturing of money has been longer term development. Um, and that is something that we can learn um, and redeploy. We've done it in the past. We did it here under Eisenhower's time. Money was used and deployed from both the federal budget as well as private, as well as individuals, as well as local banks to, to create a highway system and to basically produce um, jobs. And we had a time then where there was actual real growth. It wasn't speculative growth. Um, and there wasn't this major dislocation between CEO pay and sort of regular people's pay. I mean, it was high compared to other countries, but nowhere near what it is today. Um, and, and I think that's just a way to get back to um, real economics, real foundational economics here and in partnership with other countries. Thank you.
Thank you for coming. Um, I don't really know much about you because I just found out about you today. Um, so this question, I don't know if it's in your uh, realm of expertise, but you uh, were talking about the relationship between the Federal Reserve and the financial uh, sector. I was curious about the relationship between the Federal Reserve and the military industrial complex and how the, uh, the defense sector, how does that influence the decision making and the policy making of the Federal Reserve? And I'll sit down on that. It's, it's a really good question. It's, it, it would require a very long answer um, to, to, get, um, to get really into it. But, but just because I was bringing up Eisenhower before, um, and, and he had talked about the military industrial um, complex and, and warning about there, there being uh, sort of too much inbreeding there, and that could relate to instability. One of the things Eisenhower also talked about was, was connecting economics into that. And so at the time, um, in the wake of World War II, when the IMF and the World Bank and sort of the global central banking institutions were being created, um, the idea was that their funding, their money, would go into developing the countries that were allied to them. And so just if you go back in history, I do this in, in, in my last book in All the President's Bankers, but if you go back in history, you'll see that a lot of the, the development fund and a lot of the World Bank bonds were going towards um, building uh, either infrastructure or funding certain infrastructure related to the military or whatever it was, your ports, et cetera, in, in areas that were allies of of Europe, um, sort of the, the winners of the war in Europe and, and the United States. So there, there has been um, for a while, for decades, a relationship between um, sort of that economic concept and the military industrial complex through central banks. Um, and, and to an extent, the fact that the dollar has been the reserve currency um, of central banking throughout the world. Um, and the second currency, it's, it's well, it's, it's the euro now, but it had been the Deutsche Mark and the French franc sort of collectively before the euro um, was created in 1999. Um, it, it, it did have the effect of proliferating the military industrial complex as well. And so when you're saving the dollar, when you're creating money to um, prop up the US banking system and the US banks, which have been an integral part of financing for the military as well, um, th there is a strong connection. Um, so it's, it isn't necessarily, and it might be, some people at the Fed might, might realize that's a very strong connection, some might not even consider it because they're, they're really focused on the sort of economic part and the, the, the Wall Street part and the saving the banks and creating stability part in their minds. Um, but there's certainly um, a relationship between how many dollars are in the world and what part of our military they go to and how um, having a lot allows our military to continue to be sort of over budgeted relative to the rest of the world. It's, it's almost another book. Yeah. <laughs> But it's a good question. How will our currency be the currency of the world? That's another long question. There, there are people that, that think that because of this whole sort of situation and the instability and all of that, and the fact that we, you know, the Fed sort of supported our banks and sort of gave them rewards for being criminals, um, that, that that's going to impact the dollar and, and that's going to create all this sort of room for other countries and other currencies to create alliances with each other, to take out the dollar and so forth. To an extent, that is happening, but that is a very long-term process. It's not like tomorrow the dollar is going to collapse. The dollar has been weakening for the last few years, um, and the dollar has periods of weakening. Part of that is because other countries are developing relationships with each other. They're choosing to trade um, not in dollars, but in their own currencies back and forth. There's exchanges and, and sort of um, market that are being developed every day to do that more and more. Um, and that just, you know, if you look at it as one pie, you're basically taking a piece out of the, the dollar part of the pie and it is therefore shrinking. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's something that will evolve, I think, over time. I talk about that a lot in the book, just in different pieces. You can see all these trade agreements um, and, and currency agreements and um, relationships that have been forged in the wake of our financial crisis um, and because of this, this monetary policy, the cheap money and the Fed and all of that. And you can, you can sort of track how they develop. Um, so it does go away from the dollar, but it, it's just going to take a long time. Her question was how long it will take for the, before the dollar is no longer, um, I'm paraphrasing, the reserve currency, the main currency used in the world. I think we have to stop. But, yes, and oil is a part of it. Anyway, I would like... I, you need to read one of the chapters in my book, my friend. Thank you, <laughs> Anyway, I would like to thank all of you so much. Um, I guess I'm going to be signing books over there. <laughs>
So um, I'll be over there. But thank you very much. Thank you, Seattle. Thank you.